Hello everyone, my name is Arushi and I am a PhD student at CSI IJB and I welcome you to the Bioinformatics for Schoolers course. Today, we will be covering the second lecture of our first module. The talk today is titled as Introduction to DNA and DNA Sequencing Technologies. In the next 30 to 40 odd minutes, what we will essentially cover are the following topics. What is DNA? What is it made up of? What are mutations? How do we identify them? What can they lead to? Why is genomics important? And what lies in future of genomics? In addition to gaining a solid understanding of genomics, these topics will also help you navigate the course more effectively. So let's get started. So less than two centuries ago, all people really knew about genetics was that Children tend to look like their parents and that careful and selective breeding of dogs or crops could, you know, result in bigger and better dogs or crops. But we have learned a lot since then. In 1800s, a monk named Gregor Mendel figured that traits of pea plants, you know, like whether the peas were yellow or green, were passed on from parent to child in a way that could, you know, sometimes hide traits. So they appeared to skip a generation. He figured out how to even predict whether and when a hidden trait would show up next. Around the same time, Charles Darwin figured out how species evolve over time. You know, it was always known that, you know, the traits of pets and crops are influenced by a farmer who breeds them. But according to Darwin's theory of evolution by natural selection, it is nature rather than the human judgment which in which you know, that determines which creators are going to live long enough to have an offspring and that this idea was whole new and was, you know, done in some mysterious ways that parents could pass down traits to their children, but he had no idea how that might work. Then around in 1950s, Rosalind Franklin managed to form DNA into a crystal and take an X-ray photograph. This revealed its structure and James Watson and Francis Crick built on her work to deduce that the DNA molecule had the shape of a double helix and that the DNA structure was uniquely suited to pass down traits from one generation to the next. Over the couple of remaining decades, scientists have worked out details of exactly how DNA makes us who we are and how can we tinker with. So in this video, we will explain genetics and genomics, which is the study of how living things give their offsprings the instructions of genes for particular traits and we will also talk about you know the totality of all the information contained in your DNA and in this way we will also cover other bits of biology as needed. So genome refers to all your DNA right from mouse to yeast to chimpanzee to fruit flies to even humans all living beings have their own genome. Each genome contains the information needed to build and maintain that organism throughout its life. Now, when we talk about specifically human genomics, we can see how different we all are, right? Despite this, we've discovered in recent years that we are 99.9% .9 identical or more. And this diversity is created by a small number of changes in the genome. And that is really remarkable, right? And not only within ourselves, we are 60% similar with fruit flies, 96% with chimpanzee, share a 85% similarity with mouse, 32% with yeast. And despite the fact that we humans are 99.9% .9 identical, we can't help but wonder what is it that drives all these differences? One person is tall while another one is short. Why? Why is that? What causes someone to have blue eyes versus someone to have brown eyes? Why does one person get to live to 100 years and the other person does not? What makes one person more susceptible to cancer while the other does not? Many of these things we suspect are driven by our genomes and we want to understand more. So DNA is what makes us who we are. But how does it do that? So to answer that question, we have to zoom into a level even smaller than what microscope can see. So your body contains over 37 trillion cells. That's a huge number, right? Now, you have different types of cells, muscle cells, bone cells, neuronal cells, etc. Right? But they're so small that you can only see them with a microscope. So nearly every one of those cells contains a nucleus. And within the nucleus, there are 23 pairs of chromosomes, which in turn contains 
3.3 billion base pairs. And this in entirety is known as your genome, the complete set of DNA, which contains all the genetic instructions for you to grow, develop, and function. So think of DNA, uh, for, for example, for like a book. So in a book, you know, you are you have letters one after the another that are taken together. They form words and sentences and then chapters. So really DNA is also made up of millions of chemical components of these billion base pairs that function like letters spelling out an instruction manual with all the information it takes to build and run a human body. So that entirety of the DNA is known as your gene. So the structure of DNA, the molecular, molecular structure of DNA is crucial to understanding how DNA can carry instructions for the cell. Its structure also determines how parents can copy uh, information to pass it down to their children. So if we want to understand genetics and genomics, we have to zoom into the molecular level of DNA. So we all know that DNA is made up of two strands. So both of these strands are individual polymers and each polymer, as we know, requires a monomer. So in case of DNA, this monomer is known as a nucleotide. And this nucleotide has three components inside it. There is a sugar and phosphate backbone, which is marked by gray color strands here. And there are nucleobases which project inside uh, towards the inside of the uh, double helix. Like this is one strand, this is the second strand and nucleobases are towards the inside. Now, within the sugar and phosphate uh, backbone, there is a sugar, which is a specific kind of sugar, which is known as the deoxyribose. And this is different from the table sugar that we are all used to, that we put in our teas and coffees. But in the sense, it's from the same chemical fam family. And the phosphate is the phosphorus atom, which is surrounded by oxygen atom. And this is also attached to the sugar. So in this sugar phosphate, uh, so there's a sugar phosphate backbone. And then there's a nitrogenous base that is dangling inside now, these nitrogenous bases can come in one of the four different versions, which are nicknamed as A, T, G, and C. And we'll learn more about this in a minute. Now, before we delve into what exactly a nitrogenous base is, I want to tell you that, uh, like I mentioned, that nucleotides are the monomers of the DNA polymer, right? So, to have multiple monomers, you need to attach one nucleotide to the next. So to attach one nucleotide to the next, you attach the new nucleotide's phosphate group to the sugar on the previous nucleotides. Now coming to the nitrogenous bases, there are four different types of bases. A stands for adenine, T stands for thiamine, G stands for guanine, and C stands for cytosine. Now these have specific kind of base pairing within themselves. These are bonded to each other by hydrogen double and triple bonds. So A binds with T via two uh, via double bonds and G binds with C via three triple um, three hydrogen bonds or triple hydrogen bonds. Now, because of these bondings, there are like minor and major groups in the double strand of the DNA, and hence DNA's true shape is not the exact uh, double helical structure that we see in textbooks. But DNA's true shape is a bit of wonky and has an asymmetrical look to it. Now, if we have to ask how big is DNA? So DNA is big and small at the same time. It's a molecule. So it's very, very tiny. So you can't see it under the regular microscope, no matter how powerful the lenses are. On the other hand, there are strands of DNA, right? So these are very, very long. So if you actually unwrap the DNA in a single human cell, you would obtain a line of approximately two meters long. And if you imagine creating a ro rope with all the DNA in your body, it would reach the sun 30 times and the moon 6,000 times. So you can imagine how big is your DNA, right? So how does all this DNA keep up from tangling up inside the cells, right? So part of the answer is that it is wrapped around tiny proteins or spools, which are known as histones. Now, these spools are, you can imagine these tiny spools as, you know, sewing threads where you have, only a certain amount of thread which is accessible and the rest is, you know, wounded up inside that entire sewing thread box. So similarly, these spools can, you know, take up, uh, so the DNA can uh, wrap around one spool only 1.65 times, right? That again is not so much. So there are millions of such tiny spools inside your human body and these and the DNA is wrapped around them, which again bound to histones is also pretty big. So this mix of DNA, DNA and protein is called the chromatin and it gets tightly wrapped into a cylindrical shape, still very long, 
but think of it more like a rope you know you have these fat or um, bulky groups of threads that are accumulated towards each other and have other stretches which are you know single single loose loose stretches which are more accessible and these fat stretches or these condensed form is what you know forms a cylindrical shape and gives rise to this condensed form of chromatin which then is visible under the microscope as a chromosome or an x shaped structure which we then call as the chromosome so now we have been talking uh, or we've been discussing dna as a collection of recipes or like a book so imagine the entire dna to be a collection of recipes right so in this particular section of this presentation we will actually see how these recipes get made so many of our recipes or genes are instructions for making specific proteins right so for example our liver cells know that they have to remove toxins from our body our muscle cells you know know that you know to give strength uh, they have proteins called actin and myosin that can contract to shorten and you know there are um, uh, proteins in your blood that can carry oxygen to keep you alive right thanks to the protein called hemoglobin so each of these proteins and thousand more such proteins needs to be carefully built from the instructions contained in your dna so how exactly is it made right so let us imagine that the protein is a cake or a chocolate cake that you need to make from your entire dna right so from your entire recipe book you first need to remove the recipe of you know chocolate cake specific recipe and then only you can make it so similarly the two major steps in making the protein or the gene of interest is by copying the gene to create a new molecule of rna and with the matching of uh, that is with the matching of bases from the dna and this process is known as transcription and from dna you make uh, you know you you make a protein via the process of translation and this is according to the instructions from the rna so sometimes you know you just get confused what comes first so you can just remember it like transcription has a c so transcription comes first translation has an l so since c comes first before l so transcription happens first and then happens translation so this flow of information is uh, is the form of you know central dogma of biology which is a concept which was given by francis crick so dna is converted to rna and rna is converted to protein so the problem is that it's not really a dogma because there are a few exceptions that dna uh, rna also gets converted to dna via the process of reverse transcription and there is a self replicating property of dna however nonetheless the major flow of information happens from dna to rna via the process of transcription and from transcription to the uh, two proteins via the process of translation so what exactly is rna and why do we actually need to transcribe so rna is ribonucleic acid and compared to D dna's name right you know that dna had a deoxyribonucleic acid so these two molecules are very close and it is like dna and rna are made up of nucleotides which are in turn made up of phosphate and sugar and nitrogenous base now this sugar is deoxyribose in in terms of dna and in rna it is ribose now the chemical um, or the nucleobases also differ that rna does not have a thiamine it has only uracil so a binds with u in terms of uh, rna while g and c have the same, same um, binding that was present in dna now the question is why transcribe now in our cells most of our dna lives in the compartment called nucleus but the proteins are made outside of the nucleus which is in the main part of the cell called the cytoplasm so the process for making protein doesn't really work with double stranded dna anyway so we copy the genome information into a strand of rna called the messenger rna now again you can think of dna as you know the recipe book which are you know heavy and kind of pain to deal with deal with and you certainly wouldn't want to you know splash or spill over sauces on them in the kitchen so you keep your main recipe book in the living room and only copy the recipe that you want onto a scrap of paper to you know get cooking and come with it into the kitchen so similarly we need to transcribe you know the dna into the cytoplasm so how does it actually happen now now within cells we have enzymes whose job is to de uh, uh, whose job is to transcribe dna into rna and again these copies of enzymes are again made up of proteins now their shapes allow them to grab onto the dna and rna and do those little actions um 
you know that are required to make the transcript and then these pr- proteins are themselves made by the process of transcription and translation so one important uh, enzyme is the rna pol because it can chain nucleotides together to make the polymerase uh, poly polymer of the uh, rna that we all know it waits for the nucleotide to float into the right spot pair it onto the dna and then locks it onto the growing rna chain so it can't go away so now there are similarly many more other proteins like rna pol so one of them is called the helicase which unzips the dna helix to let other proteins get to the dna so that they can do their work so a complex of rna pol and some of these other proteins actually move as it works chugging along the dna and keeps creating that rna chain after they finish the rna uh, after they finish the proteins leave the dna strand and the double helix again zips back up so now after you have created the transcripts it's still not you know complete uh, it's still not complete the transcripts still need a bunch of finishing touches right so uh, other proteins or other spe- other proteins come around them to you know give sort of a small makeover to the- to this rna now within the transcripts there are chunks of uh, chunks of you know uh, chunks of our po- uh, portions of rna which are coding which you know would eventually give rise to a protein which are known as exons and then there is uh, there are between them are long stretches of rna that you don't uh, that you know don't code for a protein and these junk sequences are known as introns and we remove these um, junk sequences from the uh, mrna chain via a process known as splicing so a uh, splicing is to cut out these introns and to get rid of them so but why do you actually have introns in the first place you know so and how does this alternative splicing happen so um the pro- the point of alternative splicing is that you can cut the pie according to however you want right so for example in this 1 3 and 5 are retained while 2 4 and the other introns are also spliced out in the other form of the transcript you might have 2 3 4 exons while the other exons might not come up in this transcript right so they would give rise to different types of proteins so even though we have introns you know because the genome can be read up in these multiple ways and we can cut out these introns in specific when you have to make one type of proteins and you remove these introns in a different type of way when you want to make a different type of protein so you get something else entirely right so this entire process is known as um, alternative splicing so for example let us understand that you know there are multiple genes and let us understand this one particular gene c so these gray stretches in between are known as introns which are made up of special characters you know which are unreadable to us but the other other uh, exonic parts are the ones that you can you know read that emily makes red choco cake every day so when we have to make our cake we need to make our um, or our transcript where you know from the mrna the introns will be spliced out and only the readable exons are going to get joined together and hence the body is then going to know that you know from this transcript we now have to make a protein but how does this transition happen how is the process of this is where the process of translation comes into picture and how does this process of translation happen is what we will see now so um now we have made it up to you know transcription and now we have an mrna with nearly edited instructions for building a protein now the next step is to make a next step is to make the protein so the mrna has to find a ribosome now ribosome is like a gigantic uh, multi part complex of a protein and um, there are two main pieces of the ribosome where one is the larger and it looks like kind of a hamburger bun with a smaller flat at the bottom and the larger is the dome shaped top now the mrna goes between them like a meat of sandwich or when the mrna gets out into the cytoplasm all kinds of molecules you know eventually bump into um bump and one of those is the small portion of the ribosome and it is just shaped in the right way so that it can stick to the certain point of the mrna and now we uh, once this uh, smaller part sticks the larger part can now join in and now we have a machinery to make the protein but we also need some more supplies right because the proteins are made up of amino acids so we need a bunch of those also we need some way of figuring out which amino acids the recipe is calling for right now to do so to do that we have something known as the trna and right now there are only 
four bases in the RNA, right? A, U, G, and C. But there are like 20 different amino acids. So it takes three bases to spell out each amino acid. And each three base sequence is called the codons. Now, there are 64 such possible codons, out of which 61 code for a specific amino acid and three are stop codons. Now, these three stop codons tell the ribosome that their job is done. So, the amino acids are now attached to the TRN. So, once the hamburger buns of the ribosomes are attached to the beginning of the mRNA, the first three bases are available for a TRNA. So, these TRNAs need to bind, so these need to bind to, into the tRNA and it binds to the first codon rather than to a random spot later along the mRNA because ribosome has a special binding site to help it stick. Now, the few tRNAs are fitted into the slot of ribosome and matches up with the first codon of the mRNA. And at this point, the ribosome chugs down the mRNA one, three bases at each time the ribosome advances. The next tRNA finds its binding space. The ribosome connects the new amino acids to the previous ones. And in time, we have this huge uh, growing chain. Now, when the tRNA has done its job and is no longer attached to the protein, it gets to float away. And by the time our ribosome gets to the other end of the mRNA, entire protein has been now produced and now it can be folded up and transported to wherever it needs to go. Maybe even to another part of the cell or maybe even packaged so that it can leave the cell. Right? So this is how you know the proteins get made and eventually each protein can uh, lead up to a different function. But uh, since we've already mentioned that, you know, uh, there are differences within uh, within each other, which means that there are uh, the differences between um, between us, which sometimes could be harmless or could also lead to variety of diseases. So let us understand that, you know, let us again consider our original mRNA chain, which contains introns and exons to, you know, make the red chocolate cake. So now let's say there are uh, mistakes in meiosis or there are certain random uh, mutagens that can lead to mutations, which means that there would be certain changes or certain positions in your RNA where uh, the bases are susceptible to changes, which might change, right? So let's say there is one mutation that happens in the second intron, one in the second exon at the M, or uh, there's one that happens here at the A of the uh, second last exon. So when this, uh, so since the introns anyways get spliced out, the mutation that is happening in the second uh, or the first intron doesn't really matter to us because in the uh, edited transcript, this intron is not going to be there. But let's say if this M gets converted to B, now this thing is going to be read as Emily bakes red choco cake every day, which is again similar to what it meant earlier, right? It meant Emily makes red choco cake every day. So since it's a similar understandable transcript, there is a red chocolate cake that is still made. But let's say in, in, in case of this particular mistake or this particular mutation, this cake gets converted to Coke. Now the body will understand and make a protein which will eventually make a Coke. So this is completely different set, right? So this is how mutations can lead to different types of proteins that could be formed or non-functional proteins that could be formed and formed and hence could lead into, you know, disabilities or disorders. So not only disabilities or disorders, we would have all known the Ninja Turtles or Deadpools or, you know, the Hulk, which are now these real, real life, you know, mutant superpowers that we have all seen. There are also real life mutant superpowers where, you know, there are uh, people who claim to have super magnetic abilities where they can, they can, you know, attract to magnetic substances with their hands or have extra stretchable skins or, you know, have ability to survive in cold temperatures or, you know, build large amounts of muscle. So these are like real life mutant superpowers that people have. So these, these are telling us that, you know, mutations are not always harmful. They could always, they could always uh, have some extra beneficial effect, like in these cases, which wherein these real life people have mutant superpowers. But uh, there could be other celebrity mutants or mutants in the animal world where things could be, you know, harmless or you know could have led them to reach up to Guinness Book of World Records, where uh, she has a Guinness Book of World Records of being the smallest um, heighted 
person in the world where Hrithik Roshan, you know, has an extra thumb uh, or, you you know, you, in the animal world, you have these three-headed frogs or the starfish, which has only four uh, instead of five or the one-eyed um, one-eyed organisms, right? So there are mutants in the animal worlds which have got attention and there are celebrity mutants as well. Not only celebrity or real or real life mutants, we all have mutations in our general life. Like for example, we have an attached or a free ear lobe. There are different colors of eyes. We can either do tongue rolling or we cannot do that tongue rolling or we have a variety of appearances. All these traits are eventually caused by mutations or variations. Now, all the mutations are not harmful. Some of the mutations can lead to diseases. Like, for example, you would have known as progeria or dyslexia or Alzheimer's disease. In majority of these Bollywood films that you have all you you would have almost seen, right? So mutations can cause diseases, and there are certain rare genetic disorders, like for example, progeria, which you know was there in the Amitabh Bachchan's film, also where there is a mutation which leads to you know uh, which leads you to age faster than your age, so you appear more aged than you actually are, or Marfan syndrome, where you know you have thinner hands and legs which gives you a thin appearance or there are various lamellar ichthyosis where there is scaling of skins or epidermolysis where you show pyramids where you know there are there are a lot of skin disorders that are present so these are rare genetic disorders which are again caused by mutations so certain mutations are harmless or could give you mutant superpowers whereas same similarly certain mutations could also cause genetic disorders or rare genetic disorder conditions so how do we now differentiate between, you know, what is a genetic basis to it or what is a genomics basis to it? So genetics is when you have targeted studies of one or few genes and it leads to very low throughput data. Like you, like you exactly know, you know, that this is one particular gene that is responsible for giving me a rare genetic disorder. And you look at only one, one of that genes. So if you only study that, then you you are actually performing genetics. But if you study all the genes in the entire genome at a stretch or together at once, you are looking at the entire genome at a stretch. And that, again, gives you a high throughput of data. So while genetics, um, there's a lot of scope and technology with respect to genetics and genomics, there's also a hard part, you know. So genetics, you know, requires clever and experimental design. It's, it takes, you know, pains of experimentation. Whereas in genomics, you don't have to do it multiple times. You can do it at one go. But then there's a ton of data that is generated. There's a lot of uncertainty and you need a lot of computational abilities to skim through the data to make sense of, you know, what you're actually looking at. So now that we looked at uh, mutations and variants, we now have to look at that there are different types of variants that could happen. You know, there could be a single nucleotide change wherein, you know, a single base gets converted to a different, uh, gets substituted or, you know, by a different type of base. So, for example, imagine that, you know, this is a um, normal protein that contains three amino acids, which has these three codons. Now, let's say that this particular second codon, C, gets converted to A. Now, the eventual amino acid is still the same. So, it's a silent or a synonymous mutation because at the end, with, even when this mutation happened, the protein is not getting affected. The protein chain still has those three amino acids. So this is a silent or a synonymous mutation which will not lead to any phenotype. But there could be a different mutation where this A gets converted to T and hence the second amino acid instead of proline gets converted to serine. So this is now a non-synonymous mutation. There could be another where, you know, there is an insertion of a T. So now instead of the reading frame as this, it will now get shifted by one base and hence it will lead to a three different amino acids in the original Change. So this is known as a frame shift mutation. There could be other mutations where, you know, it's not only a single nucleotide change, but instead chunks of nucleotides are either deleted or inserted or duplicated or even translocated. So these are known as structural variations and these are known as single nucleotide variations. So these are like two major categories of variants that you would see uh, when we are talking about mutations or variations. Now, like we've all, we, we've all been seeing that, you know, uh, 
genome is like a book so if we actually read 10 bases uh, you know a minute it would take us 9.5 years to read out our entire genome aloud so aloud so is is sequencing as simple as reading a book so the answer is obviously no so how do you exactly do genome sequencing to find out this order of nucleotides that are present inside your genome to be able to find out or look for these mutations or variations right because otherwise how else will you know that there is a mutation or a variation inside your genome you need to read that sequence and then compare it with a reference sequence or a healthy genome sequence to find out at which position there is a change right so how do you do that reading you do it via process of genome sequencing but we cannot it's not as simple as reading a book you know it will take us 9.5 years so how exactly genome sequencing is done is that you break apart or you fragment your dna into multiple fragments and then each small fragment is read as a piece of genome and then assembled to form your entire genome so this is the broad uh, way how genome sequencing works so um, like we've al already discussed that it was in the 1950s where dna's double helical structure was discovered then uh, close to about 40 years later the human project was launched we will look at this in a bit and then uh, you know by the uh, uh, by the advent of you know newer techniques of sequencing now by 2022 there are thousands of genomes that have been sequenced so there is a multitude of um, um multitude uh, increase in the amounts of uh, genomic data that is now available to us so if you actually look at the history of you know sequencing technologies prior to their introduction sequencing was done like like we mentioned in terms of traditional genetics where you you would sequence one gene at one time it was expensive and laborious then came in human genome project which took entirely 10 years to complete and costed billions of pounds but today the entire genome can be sequenced in a few days and at a much lower cost so if we actually look at traditional sequencing methods or the founding methods in the field uh, it goes back to the gold standard method which has been a gold standard for many many years now it was developed in the mid 70s by dr frederick sanger for which he also got a nobel prize so in the uh, sanger's method of sequencing there is a short primer that binds to binds next to the region of interest now let's say there is a region of interest that you want to sequence so there will be a short primer that will bind next to the region of this interest now in the presence of four nucleotides which is a t g and c the polymerase the dna polymerase will now extend the primer by adding on to the complementary nucleotide from the template dna strand now to find the exact composition of dna sequence we need to bring this reaction to a defined stop that allows us to identify the base at the very end of this particular dna fragment so there are chemically modified nucleotides which are known as dideoxy nucleotides which is analogous to throwing a wrench into a gear okay so the polymerase enzyme can then no longer add you know normal nucleotides onto this dna chain when once a dideoxy nucleotide gets added and it signals a big stop right so the extension now stops and now we need to identify what was it right so that how do we do we identify the chain terminating nucleotide by specific fluorescent dyes now four specific colors to be exact for four different nucleotides now sanger sequencing results in the formation of extension products of various lengths terminated with dideoxy nucleotides at the 3 prime end now this extension products are then separated by capillary electrophoresis and there is a chromatogram which you know tells us the sequence of which nucleotide it was and it gives us the stretch of the sequence of our interest of the nucleo of the stretch of nucleotides that we wanted to sequence so this is how a short stretch of nucleotides you know we could sequence by incorporating chemically modified nucleotides and also adding a normal nucleotide so when a chemically modified nucleotide would encounter there it would result in a stop and different lengths of fragments would be obtained and hence we would have this uh, sequence that we wanted to read so this was the traditional or the gold standard method of sanger sequencing then came the human genome project in the 1990s uh, which spanned over two decades and there were over 3 billion dollars that were spent there were 13 it took 13 years and hundreds of scientists across dozens of countries 
to finish this human genome project so this was an endeavor to not only sequence the human genome but also genomes of bacteria yeast worm fruit fly mouse etc and it contained not only a uh, one person's exact genome it contained samples from a number of donors so this we have to remember that the human genome project did not have just one genome to sequence it had number of donors over which they were you know consensusly built into one human reference genome sequence and 99% of gene containing part of the human sequence was finished to 99.99% accuracy and there were about 3.7 million mapped human snps that we found from the human genome project but then came the advent of parallel sequencing further on so this was the major breakthrough that came up in the advent of you know um, sequencing era because then it meant that you know instead of doing one small region at one particular time it making it little expensive and laborious you could highly parallelize that means you could you could sequence many sequencing reactions at you know it could take place at the same time and that that would happen at a micro scale that meant that reactions are you know tiny and could be done at once on a chip so this was obviously fast because reactions were done in parallel and results were ready much faster and obviously because we were um, sequencing multiple genomes at uh, a single uh, flow cell or a single chip then it 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 led to you know cheaper costs than sanger sequencing and uh, typically read you know 50 to 700 nucleotides in length so next generation sequencing involves four uh, major steps the first is the genome is fragmented into multiple fragments and then because we need to add or you know multiplex multiple different uh, people or we want to parallelize multiple reactions happening at the same time we add specialized um molecules called as adapter sequences which help us you know serve as tags onto each fragment so that we can use these adapter sequences later on to fetch our sequence of interest so and also these adapters also serve as uh, there are complementary molecules to these adapters which are present on your flow cell so flow cell is a uh, device that goes inside a sequencer and on the flow cell is where you put your dna library so library is what you uh make out of you know by adding all these adapters and fragmenting your dna and multiplexing multiple people's dna and that library goes on to a glass slide called as a flow cell that flow cell goes into a sequencer and inside the sequencer you know there is this bridge amplification or on the flow cell there are complementary sequences of the adapter that are present and there is a clonal bridge amplification cycle that happens which you know creates multiple cluster multiple amplified clusters of you know each fragment and then each fragmenting each fragment undergoes multiple sequencing cycles where again the same sequencing by synthesis wherein based on one particular strand there is another strand that is synthesized complementary and that is each nucleotide that gets attached is a fluorescently labeled nucleotide so which is then detected by the fluorescence uh, laser that is there inside your sequencer and data keeps getting collected so once your data keeps getting collected after your data is collected you then you know align all your uh, like i mentioned that we fragment the dna we cannot sequence the dna at one stretch right so once these a uh, fragments are sequenced so there could be multiple fragments that are overlapping right so you uh, assemble all these uh, fragments or reads and then you know start to see what all which of these reads are now overlapping to each other to form this one assembled sequence this is how uh, parallel sequencing then came into being which is also known as the next generation sequencing so this was introduced for commercial use in 2005 and this method was initially called the massive parallel sequencing or mps because it enabled the sequencing of many dna strands at the same time instead of one at the one at one time as with the traditional sequencing that was the sanger sequencing method now this enables the interrogation of up to thousands of genes at once and not to only from one sample from multiple samples aiding in the discovery and analysis of wide variety of features of the genome it has advantages of requiring low amounts of sample input high accuracy and the ability to detect low frequency variants making it especially useful in clinical research applications 
So this is again a brief overview of the next generation sequencing workflow that I've described. So you take DNA, you extract DNA basically from either a blood sample or a urine sample or a CSF sample. And once the DNA is extracted, you perform library preparation in which you would, you know, fragment your DNA, add an adapter, make a DNA library, put this library into the sequencing machine, get your data and then do your analysis by, you know, aligning reads and then identifying variants through a computational pipeline. Now, once you have your data, there are three major things that you need to know. What is an allele? What is a genotype? And what is a variant? So at any particular, when you compare your DNA sequence with a reference sequence or, you know, with the uh, sequence that is a consensus sequence generated out of, you know, various multiple population scale projects, you compare what is your um, sequence at a particular position. So that is known as a variant. So for example, if the reference contains T and you have an all, you have an A in your sequence, so there is a T to A change in your, uh, in your sequence. Now this could be in the homozygous form or it could be in the heterozygous form. There could be a heterozygous form where, you know, one has a T, one has an A. So that is a zero one combination that you would see in your variant file, or it could be one zero vice versa. Or there could be a homozygous alternate form of your allele where you would have both as AA and there would be no reference allele that would be present in your file. So these are three major things that you need to see in your variant files. And over the decades, human genomes have seen uh, human genomes that are sequenced annually has, you know, uh, increased up to like many excess that, you know, we have so many up till 2014 alone, there were 18,000, uh, you know, sequences from humans that were available compared to just zero in 1998. So genome sequencing over the decades has increased dramatically and it's also because the sequencing cost has been reduced while the data output is all only increasing. So with this uh, background in mind, there is a lot of, um, um, you know, process of variant identification and interpretation that we have to do even after we get the data. So the first thing is to, you know, we, we will have a lot of variants that would be present in our variant file. And um, majority of them would be, you know, either synonymous mutations or intronic mutations, which we don't uh, really have evidence to correlate with a disease. So we need to assess evidence for each variant to determine its clinical impact and then assess variant or variants with respect to the patient's condition or the condition of the um, sample which we, for which we have sequenced, right? And then place that genetic result in context to determine the clinical care. So there's a lot of genetic interpretation that is required even after generating the data that is only via sequencing. So why does, you know, genomics is important in all of these uh, concepts is that it can trigger screening for the wider family, allowing them to make reproductive decisions. So for example, if you already know that there are, there are carriers or there are, there is a disease that is, you know, inherited in an autosomal recessive fashion, and there are individuals who are carrying the mutations for that particular uh, gene in a heterozygous form. So that means that since they are carriers, they will be asymptomatic. But if two such carriers marry each other, each other, which happens in, you know, most of the consanguineous marriages or marrying within the community that we see. So these two carriers, which are uh, going to marry, will have, will now result in one in four chance of the child, you know, carrying a homozygous recessive mutation of the same variant. So then you know that, you know, you could enable such screening in the wider family or the community to, you know, now allowing them to make reproductive decisions. And then there are cross-cutting touch points in every specialty and profession. So now this uh, techniques are now eventually revolutionizing diagnosis and management also in the clinical care because you're now able to sequence the entire genome in a few days, which means a massive reduction in patient journey for many patients. So earlier, what used to happen was a patient used to present with a certain clinical symptoms and would go to a doctor. Now, because there were 
there were not technologies to you know sequence the entire genome at one particular time the doctor would suspect a particular gene or would suspect a particular condition and would you know send a sample for the sequencing of that particular gene and that particular gene would come out negative then you would go for the other gene or you know panel of genes but then that implied you know paying for each test that implied increasing the cost per test also increasing the time you know reaching to the diagnosis but now since we have genomics we could you know do an exome or a genome and look at all genes together and compare it with the clinical phenotype and that you know has uh led in you know ending the diagnostic odyssey for many patients and also reducing the uh time of you know reaching the diagnosis for many patients so diagnosis is given much earlier and um if very uh, if you know there are condition specific information with respect to drugs or treatable disorders that access is uh, you know available very early on and more personalized personalized and you know points of intervention uh at an early stage you know has now opened up because of genomics so hence it has revolutionized the you know healthcare industry and management of majority of disorders so now what lies next for uh, genomics so we already understood that you know um, post 25 years after the structure of dna was you know uh, deduced there was the sanger method that was developed in 1977 and in 1990 the human genome project was launched which took over a decade and billion of dollars and even when the human genome project was completed it was evident that it, that in order to expand newer technologies had to be developed right so then came the first ngs or the next generation sequencing technology which came up in 2004 and you know that led to a dramatic increase in data output also led to massively parallel sequencing which meant you know sequencing multiple strands of dna at the same time looking at thousands of genes at the same time not only in one sample across multiple samples so gene and sample multiplexing dramatically reduced the cost per sample and additionally ngs could also you know resolve most of the problems that were encountered in sanger sequencing and now what's coming next is the third generation of you know sequencing that is now being released that is now known as the long read sequencing because in the next generation sequencing we have shorter fragments of dna it is claimed or it is known that they are a little bit error prone so now we are now evolving to the longer read lengths and you know real time single molecule sequencing which is now um, there to you know encounter even the problems that are faced by short read sequencing or next generation sequencing so we need to wait and watch you know what the next um, genomic space has for us and what it means in the clinical aspect and other things so thank you for your time and attention and we'll be happy to take any questions that are present